Not so long ago, Latin America was packed with right-wing governments, some of them dictatorships, closely aligned with the United States. The U.S. even installed some of them. A period of democratization followed with elections that changed things across the continent. Today, Latin America very definitely leans to the left. But what does it mean to be a leftist in Latin America these days? Has the end of the Cold War changed the very nature of that political ideal? And how does the new left relate to its U.S. neighbors to the north? We'll look at these questions and more next on Great Decisions. In a democracy, agreement is not essential, but participation is. Join us as we discuss today's most critical global issues. Join us for Great Decisions. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association, inspiring Americans to learn more about the world. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Star Foundation and U.S. Trust. A generation ago, if a Latin American government was deemed leftist, it generally meant a few predictable things. Socialism, populism, and alignment with the Soviet Union. But since the end of the Cold War, the Latin American left isn't so easily categorized. Social and economic reforms across the continent are taking different shapes and impacting how the countries of the region relate to the United States. Take Venezuela and its very outspoken leader, Hugo Chavez. To many, Chavez represents the classic Latin American leftist, unabashedly populist, redistributing much of his nation's wealth directly into the hands of its poorest citizens, he's built up social programs, schools, health care, almost entirely funded by Venezuela's vast oil reserves. His critics charge that his social programs have come at the expense of Venezuela's overall economy, which hasn't appreciably grown since he took power. Critics also worry about his limitations of democratic freedoms and his possible intentions to remain in power indefinitely. But Chavez is unquestionably popular, both in his country and throughout much of Latin America, where his harsh denunciations of the Bush administration and the World Bank are met with cheers. And he's fostered political partnerships with Cuba's Fidel Castro and Bolivia's Evo Morales, among others. What is strategic for us is to look for a political unity of all our countries and to have a, a, a regional project that will unite us and will create a, the potentialities and develop all the potentialities of South America to be a world player. But there's another kind of political change taking place in Latin America today, one also rooted in socialism and populism, but more conservative in its approach to governing. Brazil is the strongest economy in Latin America, but not without its problems, poverty and hunger among them. Its leader, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, is firmly rooted in the left. He was born into poverty, eventually became an outspoken union leader and socialist, and is a member of the Workers' Party. Yet his approach to governing stands in stark contrast to that of Venezuela's Hugo Chavez. Lula da Silva has moderated his more radical views and has instead focused on reforming Brazil within the bounds of the free market, implementing tax reform, passing new labor and judicial laws, hoping to encourage growth throughout all sectors. What we have today in Brazil is, I think, a, a very positive combination of uh, growth with uh, reduction of inequality. So then, is it this kind of approach to populism which makes countries like Brazil, also Chile and Uruguay, more politically attractive to the United States? How do the countries of Latin America get along with each other? Will the progressive left become the new Latin American right? And what does the future hold for the likes of Chavez? Is he bound to become the next generation's Castro, intent on holding on to power for the rest of his life? The Latin American left, coming up next on Great Decisions. And now from our New York studios, here is Ralph Begleiter. Welcome to Great Decisions. Joining us to help us explore issues related to Latin America and the march of the left in that continent, Jorge Castaneda, former foreign minister of Mexico and now professor of politics and Latin American studies at New York University, author of a new book called Ex-Mex, Migrants to Immigrants. And economist Hernando de Soto, president of the Institute of Liberty and Democracy in Lima, Peru. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. 
Uh, Jorge, you wrote uh, maybe 18 months ago or so that there would be a tsunami of leftist uh, governments taking over Latin America, particularly South America you were referring to. Uh, I'm wondering whether you still think, uh, in retrospect, it was a tsunami, and did it, did it have the kind of negative implications that the word tsunami implies? Well, I, I think there is a tsunami in the sense that the left is faring far better in every election in Latin America today than ever before. Um, it doesn't necessarily win every election. In Hernando de Soto's Peru, it didn't, but it did much better than it ever had. In Colombia, it didn't and did much better than it ever did. In Mexico, it didn't win, but did much better. Conversely, in other countries, Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, uh, Nicaragua, Ecuador, etc., the left has won elections in countries where perhaps it had not won before or had barely won before. Now, the difference is that there are two kinds of left. There is a very social democratic, globalized, moderate left in some of these countries, in Peru, in Brazil, in Chile, in Uruguay, and there is a very populist left, a much more hardline left, much more nationalistic, much more statist. Countries like Venezuela, like Nicaragua, uh, like Bolivia, like Ecuador. So I guess it, it is a tsunami, but it's a partial tsunami, and it's a partially positive tsunami, and it's a partially, I think, destructive tsunami. Hernando, maybe more of a makeover than a tsunami, kind of a makeover of appearances, or do you think it's a sub substantive change? Well, that remains to be seen because uh, many of these regimes are just on the verge of structuring what looks like further reforms, like in the case of uh, Venezuela and in the case of uh, Bolivia. We have, to see, uh, we have to see what happens. The important thing is that Jorge is right in the sense that if you look back some 10 years, Latin America has changed. Uh, the so-called market economic system, there's no other game in town, but it hasn't uh, actually um, been that successful for the majority of people in the country, and that accounts a lot for the leftward, uh, the leftward swing. What happens is that in many of these countries, as the left has recuperated, and in some cases it's not the traditional left, but it's the left has recuperated or gained space, the blueprints for what they're going to do are just uh, evolving now. That's first. That's first round. And second, um, second round, which is something that uh, uh, Jorge was uh, was leading to, it's that this has just been one wave of elections. We're going to get new elections, and those parties that for the first time got into the limelight in Mexico, in uh, in, in Peru, in other countries where they were narrowly defeated. I have now also gained strength, and they're going to get ready to compete a second time, and that uh, unless something is done about that, unless other, uh, their opponents uh, adapt to this new situation and get in tune with the people who are voting left, there could be a second round, and then it could be much more than a makeover. The Chilean ambassador talked to us about how he thinks his uh, political and social situation has evolved during this period of transfer in, in Latin America. Let's listen. We have grown steadily and during this 15 years. We will grow this year once again over 6%. And we have reduced poverty from 40% to 13% following the last service in Chile. It is very impressive. But you cannot do that without a broad political support. We have now in Chile uh, social demands very strong. Because the people say the pie is becoming so big that I would love to have a bigger part of the pie. This happens with the health worker, with teachers, and with other uh, association and worker groups. So is that kind of populist pressure on the governments, on some governments in Latin America, driving them in the direction of more populism, if you will, or uh, kind of in the leftist direction, even though they've succeeded under the kinds of reforms you were just talking about? Well, people are impatient, I, and though I must say they've been, some of them have been waiting for 20 years now. Uh, these reforms began in many countries in the 1980s. In the case of Chile, they have delivered the goods, although what the ambassador perhaps didn't point out is that though he, Chile has been very successful in combating poverty, it has not been able to make much of a dent in inequality. 
And Chile remains one of the most unequal countries in Latin America, which in turn is the most unequal region in the world. Asia is poorer. Latin America is far more unequal. So people are getting a little fed up, and there are social demands, and that's a good thing. And elections are there, so those social demands can translate into political expression, and that's the way it should be. The next step is, of course, that leaders not make irresponsible decisions. Let me ask you this. Uh, for a moment, put yourself in the position of an American foreign policy maker, maybe somebody in the National Security Council, in the White House, whatever. Uh, from a U.S. perspective, would you say this change that you've both talked about is something that you think is a threatening change or just something we've got to pay attention to, be aware of? Uh, give us some sort of substantive perspective on that. Jorge? Well, it's a little bit of both, uh, Ralph. And, uh, as I think there are those parties, movements, or governments of the left in Latin America which have emerged from exactly what Hernando was mentioning, that is, the fact that the market economic reforms of the 90s did not yet deliver the goods, maybe they will one day, they haven't yet, plus the fact that now you have elections, you didn't always have elections in Latin America, these two things combined have led these parties and leaders to win. Some of them, I think, are doing very good things for their countries, and that's good for them, and it's good for the United States, the case of Brazil, the case of Chile. Uh, the case of Uruguay, perhaps the case of a few other countries, perhaps now in Guatemala, countries like that. That's one, part, that's one issue that I think Washington should understand and should support these governments as much as, as, as it can. And in fact, for example, President Bush has made a very serious effort to be friends with President Lula of Brazil, to find common ground, to work together on energy issues, on others. Because I think, uh, finally, the United States seems to have understood this. On the other hand, leaders like Chavez of Venezuela, like Evo Morales of Bolivia, like Rafael Correa of Ecuador, like Daniel Ortega of Nicaragua, although in many cases uh, the, the, the jury is still out on exactly where they are going, uh, they do represent stances and views which are very contrary to what any American government would like for Latin America. And there the problem is what the United States is going to do. And there's been so many mistakes in the past that perhaps the best thing is to do nothing. But then sometimes when you do nothing, you end up doing silly things. And Nando, you want to comment on that? Uh, I think essentially the, the problem in Latin America is, uh, is local. It has to do with uh, elites that have interpreted U.S. models in the way that they see fit for themselves, have left out the kind of details that make them efficient, and that actually integrate a majority of the people into the market economy. It's our own version of democracy. It's not that open a democracy. It's not that open a market economy. And I don't think that there's really uh, too much that you can do uh, about that from the United States. Uh, the first thing that always amazes me about the United States is, you know, who's getting involved? Is it the White House? And, you know, being on the Latin American side, well, it's a White House for certain things. It's a member of Congress for another thing. It's a member of another committee for a third thing. It's a member of the DEA for another thing. It's a member of the CIA. So when you get involved, you don't really fine-tune or aim correctly. So the best thing would be to actually, I would say, relax your presence in Latin America and understand that what looks like proponents of market economy sometimes are not. And what look like uh, original sin leftists sometimes are people who are very willing to evolve towards a market economy, provided it plays for their constituency. Jorge, a little while ago you talked about Brazil's President Lula. That's an interesting case because uh, the United States was a little wary of, his, of him when he was elected, uh, coming from populist roots as he does. Great Decisions talked with Brazil's ambassador to the United States as well. Let's hear what he has to say. Brazil has gone from a situation where we used to export around $60 billion in 2002 uh, to one where we are exporting $150 billion now, 2006, 2007. So I think if you exclude uh, the oil exporting countries of the world, this is one of the most um, impressive performances uh, outside of China's, of course, uh, performance uh, in trade worldwide. And uh, a great deal uh, of what has been accomplished is thanks to diversification of markets. Not only the um, uh, more intense relationship with our neighbors in South America and uh, uh, also preservation and enhancement of good uh, relations with traditional partners such as the U.S., but to a great extent uh, new markets in Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. 
So Brazil doing very, very well economically. United States, President Bush had a meeting with uh, President Lula amid counter-Bush demonstrations at the time. Uh, what does this mean for the relationship and the, and the move to the left in Brazil? I think what it means, Ralph, is what Hernando de Soto was saying. When the United States uh, acts reasonably, pragmatically, uh, does not make a big fuss about things, it can get along well with someone from the left like Brazil, which, when that person of the left is like Lula and is also pragmatic and is also acting on the basis of Brazilian national interests, there is common ground on bioenergy, on looking at the world in a certain way, on, even on trade issues, there's been a certain amount of convergence. You both have mentioned, touched on, I want to get into a little bit more depth, uh, the, what perhaps is the poster boy of uh, leftism in Latin America, and that's Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. Uh, is he making a mark on the continent, uh, across the region, Central and South America, in a way that's going to drive other governments to the kind of leftist government that he's got? Or is he an outcast or an outlier, if you will, on the political spectrum? Another? Well, I don't think he's an outcast. I think he's very influential. Um, and uh, he's very influential, among other things, because he has a foreign policy. Uh, he's got ideas. He knows what he likes and he knows what he doesn't like. Uh, he's financing uh, groups or promoting groups in different parts of Latin America to activate certain ideas. He invests in samba schools in Brazil. He invests in education and uh, uh, medical assistance in Peru and uh, Bolivia. I mean, he's working. He's working very hard about it. You know, he's obviously out to make a mark. With Venezuelan oil money. With Venezuela, with Venezuelan oil money, that's where we suppose that it, that, it, that it comes from, and with a message as well. I mean, there is charisma involved. It's not just uh, only the it's not only the money. And uh, in the case of Peru, uh, it was quite clear during our last elections that he was present all throughout the uh, the election. So yes, he is an important player in the whole game. But Venezuela's economy has not done well under his uh, under his tenure. But the issue here is rather the one that Jorge was mentioning before in the case of Chile which is that wealth is not an absolute thing. In other words, if you go and say, you know, we have less poor, or the poor were on a dollar a day 10 years ago, now they're on a dollar 75, but the richest of the rich have gotten much richer, uh, it's not going to work because uh, wealth is a relative thing. Poverty is a relative thing. You're as rich as uh, the rest of your environment has made progress or not made progress. Uh, this is something, of course, that was very clearly said by uh, and analyzed by Marx back in the 1850s with a lot of success that he had over at least 100 years, his ideas did. And he called that those people that did not feel included were alienated. And alienation has nothing to do with the fact that you've doubled your income, but how you've done relative to others. And that's what's happening a lot in many parts of Latin America, what we economists call the Gini factor. That is that the distance between the poorest and the rich is getting very, is increasing. And that is a matter for concern because that's what, create, that's what leads to social conflict and that's what actually will strengthen very much uh, the hand of Hugo Chavez as he drives that point, which he may be very seriously concerned with. Both of you may be a little surprised to know that when Great Decisions talked with the Venezuelan ambassador to Washington, he did not reflect the kind of uh, rhetoric that we've heard so much from Hugo Chavez himself. Let's listen to what he has to say. If you want to do a radical social change, you have to transform the way of how democracy has been working. Because basically in our countries, democracy has been an elite type of democracies. So what you see is very educated people and people that have money that at the end they control political parties, they control the policy. So if you want to transform the agenda, you have to give the, the chance to people to be the, the real players. And this is what we are going into a whole process of, there is a revolution of participation in Venezuela. So setting aside the question of the rhetoric, uh, that's really what you were talking about also, the increasing pressure in many Latin countries for a sharing of the pie. Uh, Jorge, do you think that's going to increase the pressure for movement toward the left throughout the rest of the region? Well, it will, and I think that what Chavez does will contribute a lot to that, or not. As Fernando was saying, he is pouring money into support for groups that have affinity with him. So um, you have social pressure, you have democratic elections, and you have someone with a lot of money and a song to sing, and also Cuban support. 
Cuban cadre is working with them. Well, that's a very strong combination. Does that pose a threat to the United States? Well, this is the issue we were discussing before with Hernando, and I, I agree with him that it, the best policy is to do nothing. But the problem is that politics in general abhors void, like nature. And I'm not sure it's possible for the United States to do nothing. So then the issue is what should it do? And to hope, and I agree with Hernando, I would hope the U.S. would not get involved. But I'm afraid that it will, and so I'm not... I wonder whether it's not a better idea to suggest that the United States do something useful instead of hoping that it do nothing stupid. Well, let's, say, let's talk about what can be useful. You always think in, in the United States as if you were the result of a great British tradition. You actually broke with the British elite tradition. You broke down primogeniture, which was that only the eldest sons could get property. You broke down... Um, vo uh, voting, uh, voting by only people who had property rights. Uh, you, you actually created what is today popular, ca uh, popular capitalism, but you don't always act that way abroad. And so the thing is, if you can act in that direction and understand that capitalist systems are unsustainable unless they have a constituency, and that people not necessarily get rewarded immediately, but see the light out of the end of the tunnel, best is not to act. If you are able to actually cut the, f the hairs in three or four parts and able to make these distinctions and find a policy that actually works and get organized among yourselves so that all the voices of foreign policy in your country, which don't only come from your executive branch the way they do, say, in Europe or even in our country, but come a little bit from Congress, come from your agencies, if you can get all that together, maybe you can do some good things. But until you don't get that act together, it might be risky. You know, if we had recorded this program ten years ago or even five years ago, it would have been impossible to spend as much time as we've had without making much reference to Fidel Castro. Uh, has he become essentially irrelevant in terms of the movements you've been talking about in Latin America? Or is, is Castroism, if not Castro himself, still a, a very important factor in the region? Well, I think he, he, he remains a very important factor, perhaps more important than at other times, because in many ways he is finally fulfilling his dream of the 1960s of exporting his model, the Cuban model or revolution or what have you, uh, anti-imperialism, nationalism, to the rest of Latin America. He tried with Che Guevara in the 1960s, and that didn't work. He tried a little bit with Allende in Chile in the 1970s, and that didn't work. He tried with the Sandinistas in the 1980s, and that didn't work. And now, Chavez finally seems to be the perfect match. Uh, Cast it's Castro's ideas, Castro's cadres, Castro's experience, Castro's acumen. I mean, he's been in power now for almost 50 years. Uh, it's a long time. You learn a lot of things, and a very intelligent man learns a lot of things at 50 years in power. <coughs> and he's got Chavez's money. He's got Putin's arms more than ever before, in a way. So I think his influence in, is enormous. Not in the bigger countries. Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, no. These countries are too big, too sophisticated. But in the smaller countries, in Ecuador, in Bolivia, in Paraguay, in Nicaragua, in El Salvador... Uh, the combination of Castro and Chavez is a powerful combination. Hernando, do you agree with that, that there's still a powerful influence in the region? Oh, absolutely. And I think that Jorge is right that uh, uh, at this time he may actually be uh, stronger than, uh, than ever because he's got, uh, he's got money on his side and also because there's a change of strategy, which is not only the guerrilla military intervention, which didn't prove successful in the case of of South America and even Central America, or finally that successful, but he's learning to work the these uh, um, sort of uh, unbalanced, incomplete democratic systems. And the problem there isn't like what the Venezuelan ambassador was saying. You know, we have elites, which we all agree with. You couldn't distinguish between probably what the Venezuelan ambassador just said now uh, and what Jorge and I were saying. The question is, oh whether those arguments are going to be used to consolidate a dictatorship. That's a question. So we all agree that there's unevenness. We all agree that, there, that uh, there's inequality. We all agree that the market economy is the tools required to succeed at it are definitely not in the hands of the majority. But the, the question for us would be then, is this a cause for reform? I mean, real, let's think reform again. 
and let's think it in terms of participation, or is it a, uh, or is it a, a means to consolidate some kind of uh, uh, hegemony, some kind of a uh, strong vertical political structure in Latin America? In that case, yes, of course. If that is the case, then of course this is, this is, this is dangerous. Hernando de Soto, president of the Institute of Liberty and Democracy from Lima, Peru. Thank you for being with us on Great Decisions. Jorge Castaneda, former foreign minister of Mexico, now professor of politics and Latin American studies at New York University. Your new book is Ex-Mex, Migrants to Immigrants. Thank you both for being with us. And thank you as well for joining us on Great Decisions. I'm Ralph Begleiter. To learn more about topics discussed on Great Decisions, visit our website at www.greatdecisions.org. To order a copy of the Great Decisions Briefing Book, a DVD set of this series, or to join a Great Decisions discussion group in your area, contact the Foreign Policy Association. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Star Foundation and U.S. Trust.